Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the virtual college exploration for all North Carolina and South Carolina students sponsored by the Carolinas Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers and StriveScan. Thank you all for joining us this morning. So just a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. You can use the Q&A box at any time to ask questions for our presenters. Your camera and microphone are turned off so the panelists cannot see or hear you. This is just one of the many different sessions happening, so be sure to check out the full schedule at CACRAO.org. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available within a week at that same website, CACRAO.org. I would now like to turn it over to our presenters. All right, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to NCA Division Two, Not Your Second Choice. I uh, want to talk about uh, all the great things that Division II has to offer. Um, my name is Brandon Funk. I am one of the admissions counselors here at Francis Marion University. Uh, I am also one of the assistant men's basketball coaches here. Um, we are Francis Marion, Florence, South Carolina. We are in the Peach Belt Conference, mostly uh, Georgia schools, couple South Carolina. And next year, we are moving to Conference Carolina uh, Conference, which is mostly South Carolina, North Carolina schools uh, with a few sprinkled in from Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, I will uh, let the rest of the panel introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Hey guys, I'm Brittany Phelan. I um, currently work at Queens University of Charlotte as an admissions counselor. Um, Queens University is in the South Atlanta Conference. Um, I did graduate from Queens with my MBA in 2017 and I also swam at Queens for about a year. So. I have that background of being a student athlete in the Division II world. Nice to meet y'all. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dante Wise. I'm a senior assistant director of admissions here at Fayetteville State University. I actually graduated from Fayetteville State University in 2008, and I also am in the Division II sport, uh, or athlete, excuse me. I played football here for all four years at Fayetteville State. We're in the CIAA conference. Uh, currently, our school, Fayetteville State, has about 53 championships amongst all of our sports, and we have 11 uh, sports that do compete in Division II of the NCAA. Thank you and welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clarissa Oreck, and I'm an admissions counselor here at Newberry College. We're located in Newberry, South Carolina, uh, just about 30 minutes north of Columbia. We participate in the South Atlantic Conference, and we have 20 uh, NCAA Division II athletic teams and two spirit squads. And hello, my name is Andrew Teske. I'm Director of Undergraduate Recruiting at Coker University, located in Hartsville, South Carolina. We are also a member of the SAC South Atlantic Conference, um, and I'm an alum of Coker and was a member of the men's golf team as well here at Coker. We currently have 22 um, sports teams between men and women, and we thank you for joining us today on this presentation. As our friends at StriveScan mentioned, if you do have questions, please feel free to throw it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and throughout this presentation, there will be some charts and pictures. So if you're on your laptop or desktop, that would be best for you to be able to view those charts and pictures. Before we dive into Division II athletics specifically, we, we figured we'd take a second to kind of highlight the difference between Division I, Division II, and Division III for those of you that are not familiar. Um, as you can see by the screen, there's a ton of options when it comes to institutions all over the country. Um, and it's pretty equally split between Division I, Division II schools with Division III having a little bit more options across the country. Um, really, you know, when it comes to Division II I and Division II, those divisions do offer athletic scholarship. Um, division one's more on the full ride scholarship range, but is definitely very heavy on the sports focus. Um, so it's basically a full-time job. And Brittany will talk about that further on in this presentation. Um, when it comes to division two, you are eligible for athletic scholarship, but we like to think that it's a very healthy balance. You're not only able to play the sport you love for four years, but you're also able to concentrate on the major that you're interested in and that you're going to make a career of. Um, and in addition to that, you can go into the more demanding academic majors like nursing, engineering that you may not be able to in the division one level. Um, and then when it comes to division three, they do have athletics, uh, but unfortunately they do not offer athletic scholarships when it comes to the athletic scholarship. So 
That's kind of the difference between Division I, Division II, and Division III. And as we mentioned today, we will be focused on the Division II model. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so with the benefits of Division II athletics, something that I always like to highlight is the smaller campus and smaller class sizes. So most of the schools in a D2 is usually around maybe between 1,000 to 3,000 students. And most classes are around anywhere between 12 up to 18 students. And say if you're in a specialized major, those could even get down to five or seven students during your junior and senior year. So you really get that individualized one-on-one -on -one attention within the classroom from your advisors and your professors. And I know that's something I thoroughly enjoyed is being able to build those relationships um, in the classroom so I could get that additional help if I needed and also get great references for going to graduate school and for internships as well. I know here at Newberry College, we have about an average class size of 13. And with our athletes, a lot of them are in more intensive majors, um, such as pre-med, nursing, biology, um, and those students we have on our nursing team, um, for the volleyball team, we have actually about four nursing students. So we get that very nice balance between athletics and academics as well. And something we also like to highlight is during the summer, uh, compared to Division I schools, we have a quality of life policy. And in simple terms, basically what that means is that we do not offer um, any mandated practices at that time. So that gives you another opportunity to build on your academics, get that internship that you're thinking about, or maybe take advantage of a study abroad program for a few months and study in a different country. So you really get to have that social, academic, and athletic balance and be able to take advantage of all the things in your college experience. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Brittany and she's gonna to talk to you more about her personalized experience from being a student athlete at her school. So I echo everything Clarissa was talking about. I think with that balanced approach, you know, coming from a division one school and going to a division two school, I was seeing students on the Queen swim team, studying abroad, doing internships, being in the nursing program. Um, so there's so many other ways to get involved on campus, right, than just being an athlete. And you're able to really take advantage of those things. I think what stood out to me the most was the study abroad approach, right? I never thought as an athlete that it was possible to study abroad. Uh, but they do make it possible if that's something that you're really passionate about and you want to do. You can absolutely do it. Um, I would say, you know, with the training of Division II, you're training kind of without that major intensity of Division I. So you're still training with elite athletes. At Queens, um, specifically on the swim team, we had about three or four Olympians on the team. So you were still getting that athletic at elite training um, with those students, as well as, you know, going to class with them and kind of being around that as well. I would say the next part of that is the scholarship money, right? As Andrew had mentioned earlier, Division II athletes do earn scholarship. And I would say about 60% of Division II athletes are earning, earning athletic aid. So it's possible to come in, earn that athletic aid, have that balanced approach in a smaller campus with smaller class sizes. All right, so let's talk about some of the greats uh, and uh, other students who have gone on and played professionally uh, in their sports. I kind of highlighted some of the major sports, uh, major American sports we have here. So start with the NBA, uh, my personal favorite being a basketball coach. Uh, you can see all the greats that have uh, come from Division II. You got George Gervin, uh, the Iceman, went to uh, Eastern Michigan when they were a Division II school. They are now Division I. Uh, Manute Bull, tallest player to ever play in the NBA, and for some of you young people, Bull Bull's father. Um, he played at Bridgeport. Uh, you had Ben Wallace, uh, multi-time defense player of the year, uh, NBA two-time NBA champion with uh, the Pistons, uh, went to Virginia Union. Uh, Daryl Armstrong played on that Magic team with Shaq and Penny, uh, went to Fayetteville State uh, with <laughs> You know, it was Dante school. And then uh, Charles Oakley, Big Oak, played, you know, most of his career with the Knicks, as well as a number of other schools. Great enforcer, great player, played also at Virginia Union. Uh, we also have some currently in the NBA uh, right now. Uh, Manuel Terry uh, played at nearby Lincoln Memorial in Tennessee. Uh, he's played in a couple teams so far, the Suns, the Cavs. Um, you have Josh McGett, uh, who played at Alabama Huntsville. Uh, has played for a number of teams, pictured there with the Magic, also played uh, a number of games with the Hawks last season. Uh, and then you got Amir Hinton, 
who I actually got to coach against, um, who played at Shaw. Uh, and he's won – all three of those guys were four-year Division II guys. Demir Hinton actually transferred from one Division II to another Division II. Uh, all three were All-Americans um, and uh, I believe Player of the Year in all their conferences. Uh, and Amir Hinton, I tell you what, that dude's the truth. He, he was very good. We held him to 20, uh, which was low for him, but uh, he, uh, he's a great player. Uh, Dante, why don't you talk about some of the NFL guys uh, that have played Division Two? Awesome. And I will say, you know, being in Division Two is still very, very competitive, as Brandon alluded to. Uh, most of us know these stars that we have here on um, Pitcher, but there are other, though there are others who are also in, in, the, in the NFL. They're from Division Two schools, but we have Tyree Hill. Uh, we know him as the Human Cheetah, um, fastest man in the NFL. Uh, he's from West Alabama. Okay, uh, we have Adam Thielen from the Minnesota Vikings, and the good thing is he was at Minnesota State, so he got picked up by Minnesota Vikings. We have Malcolm Butler, again a, a very talented uh, defensive back with the New England Patriots. Okay, he went to West Alabama. Him and Tyreek went to the same school. And then we have the Delaney Walker. He went to Central Missouri, and he actually plays for the Tennessee Titans. So the great thing about these players, all these players have been in the Pro Bowl. They're all stars in the NFL, and they came from Division II sports. Now, you may not see some of the players that are also from Division II sports pictured here, but again, these are just more familiar, uh, most popular, if you will, in the NFL, and I think it's awesome that they can come from a Division II, be very competitive, and also make it to the next level and represent Division II sports. And then lastly, we'll just cover a few notable Division II players in Major League Baseball. I will say Major League Baseball, of all the, those major sports we've covered, probably has more Division II athletes than the other uh, two that we covered today. Uh, tons that are drafted every single year from Division II. Uh, but just three here. Uh, we got one, Nick Markakis uh, from my Atlanta Braves. Uh, went to Young Harris, who's actually in our conference. Uh, Tino Martinez, first base, great. Um, played for the Yankees, Mariners. Uh, went to Tampa. And then J.D. Martinez, current, uh, currently with the Red Sox, uh, played at Nova Southeastern. Again, piggyback of what Dante said, all of these guys are all-stars. I believe Tino Martinez is a Hall of Famer. Um, J.D. Martinez keeps it up. He'll have a chance to be a Hall of Famer. Uh, and not pictured are all the athletes who are not necessarily in the NBA or Major League Baseball or the NFL, but are playing professionally. I know basketball, um, you know, is huge professionally overseas in different countries and here, uh, you know, whether it's the G League or those other international competition. Uh, just me personally, I've gotten to coach 11 guys have gone on to play professionally, um, you know, for how, you know, different amounts of time. So it really is tons of opportunities if your goal is to be a professional athlete you can go division two and and really uh, live out those dreams uh just gotta make sure you're doing your job on the court and in the classroom so i'm going to tell you guys kind of a quick story just summing up division two athletics and how it has really shaped me into the person i am today um, i started out originally with division one athletics and I was constantly swimming, you know, swimming from 6 a.m. in the morning until really, you know, 10 o'clock at night, going to weight training, doing double practices and just feeling really drowned, um, trying to also complete, you know, schoolwork and things like that. So I ended up stopping swimming uh, my sophomore year. I swam through sophomore year, junior and senior year. I really focused on academics and ended up graduating. Um, and then coming to Charlotte, North Carolina, I reached out to one of the head coaches, seeing that Queens University won NCAAs. I just had missed that camaraderie <clears throat> and that feeling of being, you know, a swimmer. And I felt like I missed those last two years of swimming at um, a Division One level. So I reached out to the coach and said, you know, I, I miss it. Can I come volunteer coach? And he was like, yep, be at practice tomorrow morning, 5 a.m., We'll see you there. Um, so I ended up going to practice, probably volunteer coach for about two weeks. And he ended up saying, you know, Brittany, do you want to do you want to swim at the division two level? Do you have any any passion to do so? And I said, you know, I'm thinking about going back and getting my master's at Queens. I have a year of eligibility left. Um, so I ended up doing that. I swam at Queens division two level for one year after taking two full years off of swimming. I trained so hard for the first six months, um, got back in the water, really did what I needed to do, 
And with that personalized balanced approach, I was able to focus really more on what is important with my swimming goals, right? Every person trains so differently. So I was able to take that, those things that I learned from my division one athletics into division two as well, and really train for what was important for me. I ended up going best times. I ended up missing my Olympic time trials cuts by 0.02 of a second. Um, and mind you, this is all after taking two years off of swimming. So I think that that balanced approach of division two is really what led me to success in, in the division two athletic field, winning NCAAs um, and really just having that, that full experience and, and completing um, the experience on a high note as well. So I'll go in to talk a little bit about the day in the life of a swimmer. It's going to be much different than other sports. I know us swimmers are crazy and we train all the time, um, but kind of day in the life of a swimmer at Queens. I think the most important thing was that Wednesday recovery day, right? So this day in the life of a swimmer that I have listed out is going to just be the Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday days, and other days are going to look a little bit different. Um, so the hardest days, you know, you wake up for your first practice at 5.30, you have your first breakfast at 7.30, at class at 8 o'clock, you go to lunch, then you go to weight training, then you have your second practice, then you go to dinner, and then you have your last class of the day probably around 6.30 and maybe go to study hall for a couple of hours. Um, those are going to be the hardest days, right? You're also going to have these recovery days. On Wednesday, you have one simple practice in the afternoon where you get in the water for maybe 45 minutes just so you don't lose the feeling of being in the water. Um, meets are typically, I would say, in the fall on the weekends. Um, it kind of depends on the meet, but sometimes it will just be one day. Sometimes it will be a full weekend, kind of just depending. But in Division Two, I noticed, you know, when we do have meets on the weekends, the coaches are really great and saying, we had a meet on Sunday, take Monday off and recover and come back to practice on Tuesday. Um, where I found that not to be the case a little bit more, um, especially, you know, even in high school, sometimes we would have meets all throughout the weekend and then come back to practice on that Monday. So it really did have that balanced approach despite the 5.30 to 8 p.m. day. <laughs> I'm gonna toss it over to Andrew to talk a little bit about the golf schedule. Yeah, and for me, I mean, like Brittany mentioned, every sport's different, but what we're trying to do here is really just give you a feel for what a day in the life is of a student athlete. Um, so from the golf perspective, luckily, you know, we need sunlight outside, so we don't have to do the early 5.30 a.m. practices, which I love. Um, so typically my day would start around eight or nine with my first class of the day. I personally like to have classes in the morning, so then the, the whole entire afternoon could be set aside for practice. Um, typically lunch around 12, and then maybe one more class in the afternoon at one. Um, if not, I would head out to the country club for practice. And it really just depends on the day, like Brittany mentioned. Um, every day is different. Some days we would do short game and range practice, so we only need to be there for, you know, three hours. Other days we would be qualifying. Um, and for those of you familiar with golf, I mean, 18 holes of golf can take four, four and a half hours. So on the days that we were qualifying for a tournament, uh, we try to get out there as soon as possible, 1 or 1.30. And some days we'd be out there until about 5.30 or 6. Uh, wrap up around practice, wrap up with practice, and then head back to campus for dinner. Um, and then from there, it's, again, you're a student athlete and you're a student first. So back to the library, study hall, meetings, et cetera. And it really just depends on the day and how much you have going on in the classroom. Um, there's been some days where I'd be in the library for a couple hours. There'd be other days where I have big tests or you know midterms exams coming up and we could be there till 11, 12 o'clock at night. Um, then you wake up and do it again. And for competition, golf is unique when it comes to, we have tournaments in the fall and the spring. So we typically had about four or five tournaments in the fall. And then spring was our championship season where we had seven or eight tournaments. So we're really playing all year long. Um, but one thing remained consistent that tournaments were typically you leave Sunday, practice round Sunday afternoon, and then tournament was Monday, Tuesday, get back to campus Tuesday night, and then similar to Brittany again, that Wednesday was typically our off day where we could get caught up on classwork, we could take a break, um, and then hit the ground running again on Thursday. So that's another example of kind of life of a golfer. So we're going to talk about some unique sports that are offered in Division Two. 
Uh, we have acrobatics and tumbling. Uh, we have bowling. We have esports, field hockey, rugby. And as a football player, I don't know how they do that without helmets, but <laughs> more power to them. <laughs> we have fencing. We have skiing. And note that some um, there may, there may be some some limited options, but they do exist. And the good thing about these unique sports that uh, I know with Fayetteville State University, sometimes they may start off as a club team. Like our track and field started as a club team until interest was high enough that they can move on and become a varsity sport and compete in the conference. So if you're thinking of some sport possibly that you think is void, is a void on your campus, definitely take it to the proper offices and see if you can propose it to the athletic committee. Start as a club and you never know, maybe become a varsity sport. But again, unique sports are offered in Division II. And I will say the Peach Belt does offer esports. We don't here at France Marion, unfortunately, but I know a number of the Peach Belt schools do offer that. And we do too. We just started it, actually. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about eligibility uh, for NCA Division II. Um, you can see here uh, pictured uh, what they're looking for academically uh, to be a full qualifier and a partial qualifier. What that means, a full qualifier means you can participate in all activities, games, practices all that good stuff. Partial qualifier means you can only participate in limited activities, whether it's weights, um, you know, conditioning practice, uh, things like that. You cannot play uh, in any games. Uh, so it's always important to make sure you're a full qualifier uh, so you can participate. What they're looking for, 16 core courses, um, you have, uh, at least three Englishes and pretty much every school uh, in America is looking for four Englishes. So uh, make sure you'd have that. Three Englishes, two years of math, uh, two years of sciences, uh, natural, phys natural or physical sciences. Um, I will say number of schools in terms of getting into the school don't accept physical science. Uh, so just be careful with that. Um, also need two years of social studies, uh, three years of additional classes, uh, whether it's additional English, uh, you know, electives like Spanish, French, um, you know, additional classes that maybe, you know, if you take another science class, another social studies class, uh, and then, like I said, uh, additional four courses of uh, just those electives. So it may be, you know, keyboarding, you know, uh, all those, you know, ones that you would take that are additional that are not a PE class uh, or something of the, that nature. Uh, those, unfortunately, do not count. Um, also, they have what's called a sliding scale for Division II, uh, similar to Division I. The sliding scale is based on your GPA and test score weighted against each other. So the higher GPA you have, the lower your test score has to be. Uh, and test scores, we're looking at SAT score uh, and ACT sum score. And what that means is we're taking all the different parts of the ACT, you know, reading, uh, science, math, et cetera, and adding those scores together. So if it's 16, 16, 16, 16, you know, having the sum of that, um, will be your ACT sum score. So the higher that is, the lower your GPA can be and vice versa. Uh, obviously the goal is to have a high GPA, high test score. Uh, but if you're in one of those ranges where it's a little bit lower, that's okay. Uh, the minimum GPA to be a division two athlete is a 2.2. Uh, I know division one is a little bit higher. It's 2.5. So if you're someone who's kind of a fringe student, you know, trying to work hard to get up your grades up, there's a little leeway for you to still play college athletics. Um, you know, at the four-year level, you can go Division II with a 2.2. Uh, a couple other things with that, I do want to cover COVID. Um, you know, things have obviously changed uh, with a number of different options. I, you know, we're still finding out, you know, when teams are playing and stuff like that. Just some uh, housekeeping things for eligibility. The SAT and ACT scores will not be required for this year. Going forward, we will see they are uh, reviewing that. Uh, but for if you are a class of 2021 student athlete, you do not need your SAT or ACT score. If you have it, great. If not, that's okay. Uh, you also must meet 10 required courses before the start of your senior year and have at least that 2.2 GPA. So if you don't have all 16 uh, already by your junior year, that's okay. Um, you only have to have 10, and if you can get the last six, awesome. If not, you'll be okay as long as you have had those 10 uh, going up there uh, and you meet that 2.2. Also, the NCAA Clearinghouse is something that every student athlete must sign up for if you're looking to play in the NCA, whether it's Division One, Two, or Three. Um, the NCAA Clearinghouse is uh, where they check your eligibility uh, in amateurism. Uh, so if you sign up with the Eligibility Center uh, and create a profile, 
Uh, there you will up, have uploaded your transcripts and test scores to make sure that you are a full qualifier, partial qualifier, or non-qualifier. Uh, and then also it checks your amateurism uh, to make sure uh, that you are still considered an amateur. Uh, so not playing in any paid events, you know, playing in pro leagues, anything like that. Um, you know, making sure that you are still considered an amateur because the NCA still is considered an amateur organization. All right, so eligibility also must be based on the school that you're attending, attending, excuse me. So to be very clear that the NCAA clearinghouse eligibility is separate from the school's admission requirements, okay? They're not the same. So even though they're 2.2 far as being eligible to participate in NCAA Division II sports, you still must meet the admission requirements for your school. So some schools, depending on the school system that they're in, it may be a 2.5, it may be a 2.7. So again, as Brandon stated, make sure that your grades are high enough. You want to try to achieve higher GPA. You want to try to achieve a higher test score so that you can meet both eligibility requirements. So again, you must apply to that university and be admitted based off their college admissions requirement, okay? Again, it could be based off a of GPA. It could be based off of courses, essay. And I know right now, because of COVID-19, a lot of schools are, uh, there's two different categories. There's test optional schools and then there's test waiver schools, okay? But in both of those, schools are not holding you uh, or not providing a decision based off of your test scores, okay? And like Brandon said, if you do submit those, it doesn't hurt or it doesn't hurt or help in a sense. It kind of just, you have test scores. So again, be very clear, make sure you apply, make sure you meet the admission criteria as well as meet the NCAA eligibility. All right, so let's talk about, as an athlete, how to be seen, how to contact coaches. Uh, so this is kind of my expertise. This is half my job every day. Um, in best ways to get in touch with coaches. Email and social media, uh, direct messages to me are the best. Uh, not every coach is going to be on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, uh, but for some, the ones who are, I think that's a great way to reach out. Um, but email is always tried and true way to get in touch with us. On that email or with your direct message, things that you should have for us to see. Um, your, you know, your name, obviously, um, your height, weight, position, your, you know, your grade, what class you're in, what school you go to, uh, GPA, test scores, um, you know, if you have any you know, outside uh, things like honors or things like that are always helpful. Um, make sure you have your film attached, whether it's a full game film or a highlight. Highlights are very easy to send. Uh, full game, obviously a little bit harder, uh, but have something that we could see what you look like, what you bring to the table, strengths, weaknesses, stuff like that. Um, and then it's also really good to have contact information, not only for yourself, uh, but also your high school uh, and travel coaches, uh, because they're also giving good and sometimes not so good reviews. Uh, so making sure that you know, we get the full story out of you as a pers uh, prospective student athlete. Uh, another way to get seen is attending on-campus camps. Um, you know, some people call them elite camps, some call them prospect camps. Um, in Division II, we, uh, we do have offer this as what we call it during a quiet period, which I'll cover in a second, uh, where you can go to one of these camps and work out and play and show what you can to the coaches uh, on their campus. So you get to see campus, get a tour most of the time. Uh, and, and see campus get a feel for the school, as well as show the coaches what you bring to the table and what you bring uh, as a prospective student athlete. Uh, so when can you contact coaches? Um, first, let's talk about what contact means in terms of the NCAA. Contact is any time a coach speaks to you or a family member in person, right? So phone, text, email, social media, not considered contact. They are in fact contacting you, you know, there's communicating with you, but it's not considered contact in the eyes of the NCAA. So what are the two times, you know, multiple ways you could be in contact? Well, first you have contact period, also known as live period, um, where coaches can make contact you at events or even in your home or at your school. Um, you know, you'll have, you know, if your coach is, you know, courting you as a student athlete, they may meet with you and your family at their home. They may come meet with you and your high school coach uh, at your school. Um, and of course you have, you know, high school and travel events um, during live periods. One quick note about that division one live periods, there are a lot less of them than there are in division two. Um, you know, division two, just for example, for basketball, the whole summer pretty much is a live period, pretty much from all of July into August, where division one only has a few short, 
know, slivers of weeks. Um, so something to think about. A quiet period, like I mentioned, is when you go onto a, co a coach's campus and you have contact there. Uh, so they can't come out and see you, but you can come see them. Uh, and that's great for those prospect camps. Uh, evaluation period is anytime us coaches can come out and see you participate in your sport, but we can't be in contact with you. So we may say hello, but that's kind of the extent of it. Um, you know, you can't go much farther than that. It's just a chance for us to see you play. Uh, and then a dead period is when coaches are not allowed to make any contact, which means uh, not getting out and seeing you in person. Um, you know, but they could still call, text, all that good stuff. Where that used to not be the rule, you know, where you couldn't call or text, now they can, which is nice. All right, so let's uh, check out some of the questions we have. Clarissa has been checking the chat for us, uh, and I'm actually going to switch the slide over here. So if you have questions for us uh, going forward, uh, you can see our contact information uh, and some of the presentations our schools will be having going forward during CACRO. Uh, but Clarissa, take it away. What chat? Uh, what questions do you have? Also, we got a lot of great questions coming in, and definitely keep sending them in, everyone who's watching. Um, but the first one we have here are: What are some good ways to get looked at by Division II schools, and are most Division II schools private or public? That's great. Uh, so we kind of covered. I'm sure that one came up earlier. Kind of just covered, you know, best ways to get looked at. Um, you know, private or public. Uh, I think it's a mixed bag, honestly. Um, so just in the peach belt that I can think of, um, in here in South Carolina, we have us, Lander, and USC Aiken. All three of those are public. Uh, however, I know in the SAC, there's a number of private schools uh, as well. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, you know, there's not one specific route to take when it comes to Division II schools. Awesome. Our next question is terms of at what grade in high school should you be reaching out to coaches? Should it start in 10th, 11th, 12th? When's a great time to start making that contact? I will say this is, this is for men's basketball. Um, you know, maybe uh, Brittany or uh, Andrew or Dante can uh, answer a little bit for a different perspective, but for men's basketball, your junior year is probably a good time. Us personally, we don't recruit that far ahead uh, just because, you know, things change all the time. Uh, so we typically only recruit one year at a time. You know, so currently we're working on 2021. We're not looking too much at 22 students, uh, maybe, excuse me, just a little bit. Uh, but one, you know, that senior year is really important for us. Uh, but we do like when juniors reach out. Uh, and I know women's sports typically move a little bit faster here on campus. I know our women's sports are already on 2022 um, working on that. So uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on their sport specific and how far ahead they may look. Uh, but for us, we don't look too far ahead uh, with division two athletes. Yeah, I would, I would echo that a little bit. I would say with swimming, maybe a little bit sooner. I think we typically have our team listed out, you know, senior year, beginning of the year. Um, so junior year is a really, really important year. Um, for swimming individually and at Queens. I know that junior year is just one of those big years that, you know, students are typically coming and touring campus or meeting with the coaches and things like that. So junior year is important. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think the, the best rule of thumb I can kind of give is think about what season your sport would be for college. Um, for instance, especially here at Coker, men's and women's soccer, do a lot of the recruiting in the spring of junior year because they're in season for the fall, right? So obviously they're not gonna be doing as much recruiting during the fall season of their senior year. Um, you know, same with softball, softball, baseball, some of those sports that happens a lot during the summer. Um, so just trying to think of what season you're going to be in at the college level and then how the coaches would react. But I mean, I know in Brandon, you know, comment on it, Women's golf, softball, I mean, they're starting to recruit, especially the softball program here. I mean, they're already starting to recruit some sophomores. Um, so it really just depends on the sport. I would say female sports are definitely getting recruited a little bit more actively and earlier. Um, but I think junior year predominantly is the right year to be reaching out. And, and if I could add just one thing, you know, I think it depends on, as a 10th grader, you may be on the varsity team. Right, and you may be a, a, a standout, if you will. So as far as speaking to reaching out to the coaches, in today's day and age, technology is awesome, right? Where you can send a YouTube clip or you create your own highlight tape and you don't have to mail or actually hand it to a coach. So 
if you're interested, if you're a notable player in your high school team and you're actually on the varsity uh, portion of high school, I would definitely reach out to the coaches, you know, bug them sometimes. I know coaches don't like that, but at least you're putting them on there. You're putting yourself on their radar. Right. And then eventually they may send a scout to your game if you're good enough. Right. Um, but definitely I would say reach out and um, as early as you can, but definitely junior year, senior year is when you need to start ramping it up. Uh, so those scouts, once they come, they can view you at one of your games. And that just brings me to another point that I just thought of. Um, NCAA, as coaches, we are not allowed to contact you until, at least for basketball, and timing's different for every sport, uh, depending on their season, but for basketball, until June 15th, going into your junior year. So if you're a sophomore rising junior, we cannot contact you until then. So if you're a freshman or sophomore, we really can't contact you. Our elite camps that we hold, it's really hard for us to have allow, you know, students that young to, to come to those, you know, you can. And, you know, I know a lot of schools will offer also offer uh, team camps and that in that situation, you know, where your team gets to come play, uh, you know, against other high school teams. That's cool. Um, but it's hard for us to contact you because of NCA rules with if you're you know, a sophomore or under. Um, so it's one of those things too. Um, you know, you got to make sure you're understanding the rule where, yeah, you can reach out to us anytime, but you may not hear back from us. Um, you know, if you're a sophomore because of NCA rules, now we are allowed to write back, say, Hey, not allowed to talk to you. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, but that's the extent of it. Uh, so definitely that junior senior year is kind of emphasizing what everyone said is, is the most important. Yeah, I'd like to give just one more word of advice to Brandon when it comes to, you know, the camps that you were talking about. That is actually how I got into the swimming world. Um, I think it was my junior year of high school. I participated in a camp at Indiana University, met the coach, met some of the teammates and ended up going there, um, you know, my freshman year. So if you're really interested in a school, definitely try to take partake in some of those camps in the summer. I think it really helps to get to know the coaches. If I could just add one thing. If you, can, if you don't get the communication from the coaches, walk on once you get to that school. Now, I will say my story, quick story, I walked on at Fayetteville State University. I had some partial scholarships in different places, but I really wanted a full scholarship. So I walked on. I started all four years, all conference, all America honors, and I earned my scholarship. So if you feel like you're not getting the contact from the coaches because you're not on their radar, don't let that stop or, or – don't let that stop you from pursuing that sport at that school. Walk on if they allow walk-ons and show them what you're made of. And we actually have a JV team for basketball here. Uh, I know there's still some uh, schools in the area uh, that offer that, especially Division II, Division One. It's very rare. I know North Carolina does, but most don't. Um, so we do have a JV team, which is full of walk-on guys. And, you know, if they do what they're supposed to, their main thing we ask to them is keep your grades up, work hard, you know, show us what you got. And if we see that you have the ability to move up to varsity and, and possibly earn a scholarship, there's opportunities there. Uh, it's not guaranteed, uh, but it is, you know, an opportunity uh, for you. So definitely something to think about too, adding onto that is, you know, there are some opportunities, not a ton of JV opportunities, but there still are some um, with walk-ons. And I will say from Newberry College's perspective, it's going to echo everything everyone has been said. So junior, senior year, being able to walk on, being recruited, it's all going to be very different at each university. So our next question is in regards to being able to stack athletic and academic aid, and is there any cap on athletic aid? So I'll actually go ahead and give the perspective from Newberry College real quick before I turn it over to everybody else. Um, you can stack um, here at Newberry College academic and athletic aid. Um, for us, our academic ranges from six to 12,000, and that is based on merit. So that's going to be your GPA and your test score. And then athletic aid is all going to come strictly from the coach. Each sport has their own matrix that they use to determine what amount can be given to you. Um, and those amounts range across the board and are different at each sport as well. And I'm pretty sure everyone else will have their own way as well. Um, but it's definitely something that can be stackable. Oh, we love it. Uh, we love when you bring in academic scholarships because that is less money we have to take out of our athletic budget. Uh, so if you are coming in, here's a good example. We have a guy on our team right now, Jaleel Robinson, uh, South Carolina, went to Gray uh, Collegiate. Great player, you know, great young guy. Uh, he came in and had life scholarship, which we have in South Carolina, which one of the state scholarships. Also had a little bit of other academic money and then uh, had some grants. Um, 
So with that, we only had to give him a few thousand dollars and that covered a full scholarship for him because of everything that he brought his financial aid package uh, with, you know, the, the grants and the academic deals. So yes, you can stack them and we love it. So with Jaleel being in that situation, we have one or two other guys that are similar, maybe not quite as extreme. Um, that gives us more scholarship money to throw around to another potential student athlete um, to, to bring in another player. So if we're, you know, recruiting a couple guys for a number of positions, maybe we need a big guy, you know, and we are a little bit low on money. If you come in and we only have to spend a, a few thousand on you, that makes our job so much easier uh, to go find another player uh, as well to help boost our, the strength of our team. Uh, so yes, please, 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 please uh, stack your academic scholarships, your grants, all that good stuff. We love it. Uh, it is one of our favorite things, uh, especially when looking at high school students uh, that they're bringing in that academic money. Queens is also stackable, I would say, you know, when it comes to athletic aid, as well as merit-based scholarship, as Clarissa said, we give up to 14,500 in merit, which is stackable on the athletic aid. And then your FAFSA money, so your need-based scholarship is also stackable on that. So you have those three stackable things, and then you may also have grants, loans, maybe any outside scholarships, which all outside scholarships are stackable too. Um, so really making sure you're doing your due diligence of, you know, applying for those outside scholarships, making sure you're really working your hardest on your application to try to get the most merit-based scholarship possible. Yeah, and, and Coker's the same way. Um, we offer academic merit scholarships up to $15,000, um, and that can be stacked on top with athletic, with the in-state scholarships Brandon was talking about, as well as the federal grants. Um, so there's really four different areas. And if you have all four, you're eligible for all four, we will stack all four. Um, at the end of the day, and I think I can speak on behalf of everybody on this panel, we're trying to give you the best deal for your, the institution. Um, you know, we really do wanna make it feasible and affordable for you and your family. So have your you know, son or daughter, if you're a kid watching, definitely work hard and be strong academically because it's gonna help you when it comes out of athletic award like Brandon was talking about. Awesome, so we are almost coming up at the end of our session. So I will say if you sent in a question and it has not been answered, we will get a list of those questions at the end and we'll be reaching out to you individually to answer those questions. But we'll do just one more. Um, but it is, what kinds of questions as a prospective athlete should I be asking the coach um, just in general or about their philosophy regarding Division II sports? What kinds of questions should they be looking to ask them? Uh, I guess it's, everybody's different, right? So every student is looking for a different thing. So when I'm in the recruiting process, I ask, well, what are you looking in a school, looking for in a school? What are you looking for in a basketball program? All that stuff. As a student asking the coaches, I think it's important to ask, where do I fit? You know, if you're recruiting me, where do I fit uh, in, your, in your plans? Um, you know, what's your style of play? And a lot of that is making sure you're going out and seeing these schools. I know it's a lot of fun to go to Clemson and go to NC State and Duke and watch their games, and they are awesome. But make sure you go check out a couple of Division II games um, you know, and, and see the high level of intensity that they're playing at. And so you understand, you know, what you need to bring to the table. Uh, Cause that's a big thing, you know, in recruiting, we're looking for someone, if we're a division two school, we're looking for a low major, mid major division one player. Uh, you know, we're not looking for a division two player. So making sure you're seeing that, but also, um, you know, ask what you are looking for. It's, it's so important that you're getting the best four years that you can out of the school you're going to trying to limit transfers. Uh, so what do you want to know, uh, about the school, you know, what are, you know, and the program, just what, what's the most important things to you? And that, that's just the things to definitely ask the coaches because they're going to be open. Most of them, I know not everybody's the same, but at least here at FMU, we're, we're all about honesty. We're open books. Uh, so we want to make sure that you have the best experience while you're here. Yeah, I would make sure too, you know, when you're, seeing all these different teams, right? Just think you're gonna be with these people on the team for the next four years all the time, right? You're gonna be with them as you saw my swimming schedule and Andrew's golf schedule all day. So make sure it's a team that you fit in with, you get along with the people there, you get along with the coach um, and just make sure you guys are all looking for the same types of things. 
Thank you all for joining us today. Um, at the end, when you close this window, there will be um, a very quick four question survey that will appear. Um, and be sure to check out all of the additional sessions that are being offered at CACRAO.org. Um, and this session will be made available within a week on that same website at CACRAO.org. Thank you all so much.